So we are in a series called Hey Siri, and uh, we thought we would uh, have that title because so many of us ask our phones uh, for solutions to all types of problems in our lives now. We don't have to Google it or go to the library even. We can just ask Siri. But this series was put together by you. Back on Easter, we gave you a survey of several different things. And one of the things that we asked you is, what messages and what topics would you like to hear in a message series? And so I told you last week as we kicked off the series, if you don't like what we talk about, it's your fault. Because y'all picked the messages. And today, uh, I just want to tell you, today is an especially difficult one. And this is not one that if we were trying to really grow the church, we would have messages like today because today is not going to be extremely pleasant. The topic is dealing with difficult people. Dealing with difficult people. It was one, I believe it was the number two topic that you guys asked for us to deal with. And so we thought we would uh, cover that topic today. How many of you have ever had to deal with a difficult person in your life? Yeah, maybe a boss. Yeah, maybe a coworker, family member. How many of you are sitting next to that person right now? Put your hands down. That is really rude. <laughs> that was a trick question. Don't do that. Don't elbow people. That was wrong. Like, I just lost half the congregation. Like, he's talking about you right now. You need to pay attention. You're really difficult. How many of you know that uh, we want to solve our issues and our problems when we have to deal with difficult people? But many times, the solutions that we choose... The way that we choose to deal with our situation often makes it worse, not better. My father-in-law was here last weekend, and they, uh, my father and mother-in-law, they spoke to our leaders and our teams at our team night. How many of you guys were there for that? Awesome. And my father-in-law loves to tell Boudreaux and Thibodeau jokes. And so in honor of him, because he told one last week, before we get into the message today, I want to tell you a little story about Boudreaux and Thibodeau. One day, Boudreaux goes to breakfast with some of his friends, and they notice this shirt looks really weird. There's something underneath his shirt. He's just, it's not fitting right. And they said, Boudreaux, what do you got on that shirt? He said, I got dynamite under this shirt. He said, well, Boudreaux, why do you got dynamite under that shirt? He said, I know in just a few minutes, Thibodeau is going to come in here and slap me on my chest. He said, last week, he came in, and he always, every time he sees me, he slaps me on my chest. And last week, he slapped me on my chest and broke all my cigars. This time, he slaps me on my chest, I'm going to blow his hand off. Yeah, that's as good as they get, yeah. How many of you know sometimes we want to solve our problems, but we make it worse? We want to hurt them, but we actually end up hurting ourselves. And, uh, and today, I'm just going to tell you, it's a tough message, because many of our solutions, uh, we want to hurt other people, we end up hurting ourselves, and God's Word has solutions in dealing with difficult people, but it's tough, it's tough even for me. And uh, so... What we do is we need to realize today that we, if we engage with the people around us God's way, not our way, it gives him the freedom to do something on our behalf. If we keep doing it our way, if we keep treating people the way that we want to treat them and react to them the way that we feel like we should react to them, it's just going to cause us more harm than it actually will even cause them. We're going to pick up this message in a, the book of James. James was the half-brother of Jesus. Uh, He wasn't fathered by the Holy Spirit, so he was fathered by Joseph, so they're half-brothers. And if you ever want to read a a book that just deals with how we walk out our Christian life in practical Monday through Saturday kind of living, read the book of James. Because it's just filled with very simple, very practical tools on how to live out our lives. And James is writing in chapter 4, And he says, I want you to understand, I get it, that you're having problems with other people. But I want you to know why you're actually having difficulty. In chapter 4, he says this, what causes fights and quarrels among you? And everybody knows what causes fights and quarrels among us, don't we? It's them. They did it. It's their fault. They caused the fight. They caused the problem. And truth be told is this, is that if any of you that are having a problem with another person in your life, and you're having difficulty with them, if we sat down one-on-one, whether you talk to me or anyone else about your issue, you know what we would do? We would agree with you. Yeah, they are the problem. They are the issue. But James says, hang on a minute. Before you decide that it's actually them that's the problem, let's look at this. Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? James flips the whole thing upside down. He says, the problem is actually not out there. The problem is in here. 
He says, you've got a problem. And this, this is actually tough to hear. The most uh, issues that we have with other people have to do not with them and what they're doing, but what it does to us and what's going on inside us. And James says, I want, to, I want you to know that they may be a difficult person. They may be causing you problems. But it's really important for you to realize that the issue is not with them, it's inside. Here's why. Because if you and I make the solution to our circumstance and the solution to our problems and our peace and our happiness dependent on them, then we actually have given them power over our life. Many of us are sitting in this room today still stewing over a situation that happened 10 years ago, 30 years ago waiting for that person to ever come to us and make it right. And we have lived maybe a year, 10, or even 30 years bound up with greed and envy and all of these things and all of this unforgiveness in our hearts and hoping that one day they'll be able to come and say, would you forgive me? And we can say, well, actually, I didn't want to, but I guess I will. James says, listen, as long as you make their action the solution to your problem, your life is in their hands. It actually comes from what's going on inside you. He says this. He said, you want something, but you don't get it. And this is the source of all frustration, all anger, all bitterness, all things that are in our lives that are not of God. This is the source right here, is that you and I sit in this room and we say, but I deserved it. Maybe you're sitting here today and you said, I deserved that pay raise. I deserved that job. I deserved to get my way in that situation. I deserved the highway when that person cut me off in Houston traffic. Can I get an amen? Like, that was my lane, bro. What are you doing, right? And you you just told them they're number one, you know. Uh, (laughs) Made you feel better, right? Until this morning, you're like, ah, I shouldn't have done that. So what James is saying is this. The issue that you're having is you have a war. You have a battle in you. And what you're doing is this. You're trying to lay claim to your rights to what you believe you're entitled to, and what you deserve. And James says, what you need to do is this. You need to open your hands and release the claim. Because as long as you hold on to this, the person, they're not hurting, you're hurting. He says this, if you don't let go of this, it's going to eat you alive to the point where it's going to be a real serious problem in your life. He says this, you kill and covet, but cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. He says, listen, here's what you're going to do. You bow up, you bow up, you blow up, you clam up, and you hole up. You bow up, blow up, clam up, and hole up. Why do we do that? Why do we blow up on people? Why do we bow up on them and get so mad we try to do something to them? Why do we retreat and make them come and find us in our room? Why do we do that? You know why we do it? Because it works, doesn't it? It works because we try to twist the situation on them and we want to make them mad. I want to get back at you. I want to be in control of the situation. And so we go so far, he says, if you don't deal with this, it'll actually take you all the way to killing someone. And so what we do is we use our tools of manipulation to try to get back at the other person and to the point that it just escalates the problem, it doesn't actually solve it. So James says, here, I'm going to give you a solution. This is a tough one, but here's the solution. You do not have because you do not ask God. You haven't talked to God about this. We've talked to everybody else. We've talked to our spouse, we've talked to our friends, anybody that we can create an alliance with and tell them just how bad the other person is, but we don't talk to God. And here's the truth about this. You may be in this room this morning and you have never experienced what God can do when you turn something over to Him. And what I'll tell you is this, what I'm saying to you will never make sense until you do it. It'll never make sense to you until you turn something over to God, a situation over to God, a person over to Him and say, Lord, I need you to deal with this problem. So today's tough challenge is actually this. Instead of trying to change people, let God change you. Perhaps He has that person in your life because He's working on something in you. Maybe you need an antagonist in your story. And we're saying, God, I want you to do something in them. And God is saying, hey, I want to do something in you. I want to use this situation. 
I want to use the good, the bad, the ugly of your life to continue to perfect my image in you. And we have to understand as long as we continue to depend on others for our happiness and our peace, God cannot change me. He can't change us. Let me give you five things in dealing with difficult people this morning. The first one is this. We need to overlook the offense from them. Overlook the offense from them. America has gotten really bad about this because we have a thing called antisocial media. I mean, social media. And somehow we've given ourselves the right to say whatever we want about whomever we want, however we want to say it, no matter how degrading, no matter how ugly it is, because we're doing it from the safety of our house or a coffee shop sitting behind the screen, things that we would never, ever possibly think of saying in public, we will say. And unfortunately, this is also true of the church. Many of us sitting in this room write scathing reviews of other people and post them to our social media. And this is a problem. The issue in America has become this. I can't just disagree with you. I have to hate you. I have to want you to die. And that's the culture that we live in. But the Scripture gives us a radically different perspective on how we are supposed to deal with people and deal with offenses and issues that come up in our life. Here's what it says in Proverbs. When a fool is annoyed, he quickly lets it be known. Just hang right there. When a fool is annoyed, he quickly lets it be known. Do you quickly let it be known? Because I didn't say anything. The Scripture said something. It says fools stink up the room. Fools want to say everything about everything. And they quickly let it be known. But wise people will ignore an insult. It says this in Proverbs 19, a man's wisdom gives him patience. It is to his glory to overlook an offense. So when you are able to overlook an offense, the scripture actually says that is honorable. It is to your glory to be able to say, yeah, that happened, but I'm going to move on. How in the world can you do this? What is the secret for being able to have something happen to you and then overlook it or move on or continue to be in a relationship with that person? The big secret is this word, empathy. It's this thought that must be in your mind and in my mind. They must be that way for a reason. They must be that way for a reason. Something must be going on in their life. Love looks past the behavior to the pain in their life. There must be something going on in their life that I don't know about. So when somebody annoys you, here's a helpful tool for you. Just imagine that person must have just gotten the worst possible news in their life. It's probably not true, but it'll help you. <laughs> you begin to think, man, what must be going on in that person's life? What, they, what must they be dealing with that would cause them to be this way? Stephen Covey, uh, the author of Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, if you've ever read that, he's a leadership coach and author. In that book and in his seminars on uh, Seven Habits, he tells a story about being on a New York subway headed back home. And as he boards the subway, another family boards the subway, and it's a father and I think three or four children. And as they're riding on the subway, these three to four children just begin to basically terrorize every single person on the train. And the father is just completely checked out. He's not paying attention at all. And the kids are running wild. They're noisy. They're messing with other people. They're, they're harassing old ladies. And finally, Stephen has had enough. And he goes to the man. And he says, sir, are you aware of what your children are doing? And almost as out of a stupor, the, the man snaps back to himself. And he says, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry didn't realize that. We have just come from the hospital. Their mother passed away. And he said, and in that moment, everything changed. The kids were just as noisy. They were just as problematic. There were just as many things going on. But his perception of what was going on in this father's neglect and his absence in the situation made complete sense. And so empathy, beginning to think about what must be going on in a person's life will help you a lot. That's the first one. Overlook the offense. Number two is pray for them. Just pray a really good prayer. Like give them poison ivy, Jesus. A really, a really good case of the rash. Just everywhere. Don't pray that. That's what... David prayed prayers like that in Psalms. Have you guys ever read Psalms? 
You start off a chapter in Psalms, it's like, God, smash the teeth of the wicked. Just like punch them right in the face. Knock all their teeth out, God. But he began to pray for them. And what's interesting is if you'll read most of the Psalms that start that way, by the end of the chapter, everything is different because he's talking to God about the situation and what's happening, and it begins to soften his heart. And here's what I want you to understand. Prayer for them will soften your heart. It may not change them, but it will change you. Jesus gave us this command in Matthew chapter 5. He said, you have heard it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. This is the cultural standard. If somebody loves you, hey man, love them back. They hate you, just pile it back onto them. Hate them. That's the cultural norm. That's the, what we're living in in our society today. And he says, but I tell you, who do we follow? We follow Jesus, right? So this may be the cultural standard, and this may be the way that everyone else is treating everyone else, but I'm telling you, to, let's do something different. I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. A miracle begins to happen in your life and in my life when we begin to pray for people that are persecuting us. Most of us in this room don't have somebody that is actively looking to persecute us. We're just dealing with junk, their junk, and their horrible management or their bad attitude during the day. But Jesus said, go as far as those who would persecute you for your faith, those who would blast you on Facebook, those who would harass you in every way. I want you to pray for them because a miracle happens in us. And here's what the miracle is. My prayer for others may not change them, but it will change me. So here's the challenge this morning. Name a person or name a group that you don't like. It doesn't take long, does it? You just immediately thought of them. You like that person. Like you've been thinking of them the whole message. You're like, ah, I'm ready for this sermon. Because I had the person, like I didn't title it Dealing with Difficult People. I said Dealing with Brian. That's how I wrote this message, right? The name a person, name a group that you don't like, and pray for them. And watch what happens in you. We want to pray for them. The third thing we need to do is forgive them. And understand, you're like, well, I can't forgive them because they haven't paid it back. This is not talking about reconciliation. This is not talking about making everything hunky-dory between you and them and getting all on the same page and they've cried and told you they were wrong for everything. This isn't reconciliation. It's not ignoring that it happened, just pretending it away. It's not minimizing what they did. Oh, they didn't mean it. It's not any of that. What it is is this, is that you and I just refuse to hold the bill and say, you've got to pay this back. I'm going to let that go. I'm going to give that to God. And Jesus said, don't do this because they deserve it, but if you do this, it will help you. And Colossians tells us this, you must make allowance for, every, for each other's faults. Like you've got to give an allowance to people in your life. To where there's some change in your pocket when someone does something stupid. Because it's going to be me one of these days. I would appreciate you have some grace for me because I happen to be a human. So make an allowance. So when I do something dumb or you do something dumb, so we've got some change in our pocket that we have made an allowance for each other's faults and forgive the person who offends you. Remember, here's the key, the Lord forgave you. So you must forgive others. You're like, well, this is too hard. This is too hard to do. Here's what I can promise you. There's not a single person in this room that will ever forgive someone else more than God has forgiven you. It won't ever happen. You say, well, you don't understand what they did. You don't understand what you did and what I did to God when we sinned and broke covenant with Him and broke relationship. We will never forgive more than we have been forgiven. And understand this, forgiving someone won't change the past, but it can change my future. You can set yourself on a completely different path with forgiveness. Because here's what you need to understand. Blame empowers them. I feel really strongly, I just need to stop here for a moment on this. Because I'm friends with a lot of folks on social media and I see a lot of blame and a lot of complaining. But here's what you need to understand. When we begin to blame, it just shifts the center of power into their court. Because what we are saying is, this is your responsibility, not mine. You have to fix this. I have no part in it. I am this way because of you. 
Well, that's simply an excuse out of responsibility that Jesus has given each one of us over our own lives. So when we begin to blame, it empowers them. And forgiving someone sets a prisoner free. This one. It doesn't set them free. You're like, well, I can't, I'm not going to let them get out of jail free. No, you're going to let yourself get out of jail free. So that we need to forgive them. Number four is we need to bless them. This one, we have our, every one of these we have trouble with. I, like, I wish I could just skip this message and go to something else. I don't want to preach it. Because then I'm just like, this week I'm having to live it. I'm like, ah. like when I study for messages, usually I have to live it that week. And I'm like, I didn't want to do this. To bless someone means to speak well of them. Now think about that. Think about the person that you know doesn't deserve kudos. They don't deserve a blessing. They don't deserve someone saying something good and nice and kind about them. The solution is that we bless them. We don't choose to run them down. We don't choose to justify ourselves. Do you know what the normal thing for every single one of us in this room, including myself, to do is? When someone says something about us, the first thing we do is we start telling other people how bad they are. Well, I know, but I mean, did you know this about them? And really the situation is this, and I is really good, and me, and I'm good, and I, and we begin to justify ourselves and make ourselves look good, but instead we need to speak well of them. And here's what I'm challenging every single one of you to do that have a social media account in Jesus' name. Speak well of people. And some of you, you've been through step three of the connect track, our leadership, honor code, and our covenant, and you need to go back again. Because part of what we ask you is behave on social media. Because you don't get to leave this room and not represent Jesus and not represent this church. And so when you use your social media platform for something that dishonors God and dishonors your church family, you're saying that's how we all feel. And that ain't true. Speak well, bless. And so I'm challenging you. Don't put your dirty laundry on social media. Don't tell everybody how awful that person in your life is. Stop it. Because it doesn't help you. It actually makes you look worse. Because you're playing the victim and wanting everybody to tell you how compassionate they are about your life. And listen, I get it. There's stuff that we need to talk about. There's issues. We need to talk about the issues, not talk about the people. So in private, and I'm talking about one-on-one -on -one in this church, when you have that aside conversation, when you've been hurt and you've been torn apart, be careful what you say because we need to bless them. When you use your social media account and you're typing with your thumbs, be careful what you say because we need to bless them. Let's not run other people down. First Peter says it like this, do not do wrong to repay a wrong. Well, that ain't fair. Do not do wrong to someone in order to pay, repay a wrong they've done to you. And do not insult to repay an insult. Watch this now. But repay with a blessing. Like I just, I just want to be done, right? This is hard. But this is what Scripture commands us as followers of Jesus to live with a completely different DNA in a completely different culture to where people in the world wonder, what in the world has gotten into you? You are so different. There's such a contrast. Repay with a blessing. Watch this. Because you yourselves were called to do this so that you might what? That's important. He said, God has asked you to do this. And when you repay the insult with a blessing, when you do good to repay evil, you're setting yourself up to receive a return on your life of a blessing that God wants to give you. Blessing rebounds back on your life. So the question is this, is what do you want to receive back? You want to receive a blessing or do you want to receive a curse? You want to receive a good report about you or a bad report about you? What we say sets that up according to the scripture. Our words are either building or they are breaking our life. We create our world with our words. What we are living in much of it is created by what you and I have spoken because the Bible tells us, the Scripture tells us so clearly that we have power of life and death right here in our tongue. That the things that we say have the ability to create or they have the ability to kill. 
So we need to bless. So there's one more level, and it's this. Do good to them. Romans 12 says this. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Let me pause there. Many of us say it's not possible to live at peace, but what we actually have done is excused ourselves from this part of this scripture, where it says, as much as the ball is in your court, live at peace. Now, I understand they're going to continue to be the way that they are and do the things that they've done, but for your part of this equation, don't stir it up, but as much as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. Let God deal with the person. That's why you pray and bring them before the Lord. Because the trust is this, Father, I don't know when and I don't know how, but you've seen what has happened to me and I'm going to leave this person in your hands and I trust you to deal with them according to what you want to do. On the contrary, he says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. He's saying, he's saying here, if they cuss you, buy them them a Happy Meal. Bring them food. If your enemy, if you find him in a situation where he has a need, bring that to him. Meet his need. And you're like, I don't want to do that. Well, none of us want to do that, but this is what Scripture commands of us. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. He said, you will heap burning coals on his head. Now, that's awesome. I love that part. Like, we're going to burn them. It feels bad, doesn't it? It's hot. It's like, can we literally put coals on people's head? That would be amazing. That's what happened to me. Um, stinks too, man. Hair when it burns, whoo, that's bad. Okay, that's not really true. Um, what this actually talks about is that coals in this era, in this time, were so important for life. You never needed coals to go out because you needed to cook with it. You needed to clean with it. So many things that you needed fire as a source of all provision for your life. And it says you are giving them what they need for their life when you do what's contrary to what we want to do. He says this, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And so as we close today, I'll just tell you this, this is impossible to do until you've received it for yourself. This is not natural. But there is an empowering that comes from the Holy Spirit as He lives in us and through us to represent the nature of who Jesus was. And without that relationship, this just doesn't work. But once you have been on the receiving end of God's grace for your life, this becomes a little easier. Because you and I get our eyes opened the immense debt that we owed God and how much we had offended Him and yet through Jesus He gave us everything and restored us back to Him. God has overlooked our offenses including mine. Like I know me and I know my history and I can tell you standing on this stage I don't deserve to stand on this stage. But God has overlooked my offenses. He has overlooked my sin because Jesus made a way for that to happen. And so my question this morning is this, is how about you? Where are you today in receiving that forgiveness? This is why Jesus could say this to us, freely you have received. You didn't earn the forgiveness that you got. So turn around and freely give it. They're not earning it. They don't deserve it. The scripture says while you and I were still enemies with God, when we hated his guts, Christ died for us. And so I'll just tell you this, is that once you've been on the receiving end of God's grace, this is way easier to walk out and do. To overlook their offense, to pray for them, to forgive them, to speak well of them, and to even do good for them. And so that's the day why I would challenge you. You have to experience His forgiveness in your life. You have to walk in this. 
He wants to empower us to do what only He can empower us to do. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? I want to pray and close this out. Father, I know that today this message isn't pleasant. And that coming to follow you, Jesus, so many times we're all about the forgiveness that we can receive and the heaven that we can gain. But then there's an entire other piece of our lives that you want us to turn around and be a representative of you here on this planet to be a demonstration of who you are to those around us. And honestly, it's difficult because we find ourselves so many times at a crossroads of being like you or being like who we've always been. So I'm asking you for your strength and for your power for every single person in this room today. I just want to ask you a question this morning. Every head bowed every person just thinking about what you've heard this morning. I want to ask you a question. Have you received God's forgiveness for you? Are you in a place this morning to where you realize, I need God to forgive me? I've got some junk and some things in my life. I've broken my relationship. I've walked away from Him. I find myself this morning far from God, and I want to come back to Him. Maybe you've never made a decision to receive the forgiveness that Jesus has made available to you. My challenge for you this morning is reach out to Him in this moment. See, the good news is this, is that you and I don't deserve anything from God. And yet, He gave us forgiveness and opened the door to relationship with Him. So if you're in this room this morning and you say, John... I need God's forgiveness or I need to come back to God or I need to begin a relationship with God for the first time this morning. You find yourself today needing His forgiveness, needing to return back into a relationship with Him or to start one for the very first time. Any of those three things, I want to pray with you right where you're seated. I'm not going to ask you to come forward or do anything else. I just want to pray with you right where you are. But would you have the courage with every head bowed to just slip your hand up and say, I need God's forgiveness this morning. Across the room, just say right where I am. I see your hand. I see you. I see you. I see you. I need to return to God today. I need His forgiveness in my life. I see your hands. You can put them down. If you're here and you raise your hands for that prayer, we, your church family, everyone around you, including you, I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer out loud, loud enough to hear your own voice. I'm going to give you the words to say. There's nothing magic about this prayer. It's just me giving you kind of a context to to have a conversation with your Father in heaven. So with every head bowed, would every person in this room, would you say this with me? Dear Lord Jesus, I need forgiveness today. I come back to you. I acknowledge I've broken your heart. I've broken your law. I've sinned. But today I ask for forgiveness. Come into my life, be my Lord and Savior. And from this day forward, I will live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, one more prayer. I want to pray across this room. If you keep your heads bowed for just a moment. I think this message hit really hard for a lot of people. Because I know it hit hard for me. And you want to acknowledge this morning that you're dealing with some difficult people and difficult situations in your life. And you need the Father's help to walk through the junk that you're walking through. You're like, I get it, and I even agree with it, but I don't like it, and I don't know if I can do it. But I'm acknowledging this morning, I want to, and I'm asking Holy Spirit to live His life through me so that I can do this, because I need help more than I can do on my own. I need His help this morning. And you'd acknowledge, that's me. I want to do it. But I need the help of the Holy Spirit to walk this out. I've got difficult people and difficult issues. I need help this morning. Would you just raise your hand? I'm going to pray a prayer just for all of us. Yeah, everywhere. Mine's up. Mine's up right now. So, Father, you see every lifted hand in this room right now. You see every person that says, Lord, I've got stuff. 
And I don't know what that stuff is. I know it's so simple to say standing on this platform. And I know it's so simple to read your word. And it's so clear what it says. But Lord, there's some people in this room this morning that have suffered some horrendous abuse. They've suffered betrayal on the deepest level. They're right in the middle of what many of us would call hell in their life right now. And so we're calling out to you. We're praying for you this morning. Father, give us the help that we need. We want to be obedient. We want to be sons and daughters of God. We want to live this thing out. But we're just being honest. This is difficult. So we're asking for your help today that you would help us in Jesus' name deal with every single difficult person in our life and walk this out to honor you in the name of Jesus.